Yes, do you think we've slightly overdone the whole Halloween thing this year? What do you mean? Well, you know, with these masks. I haven't got a mask on. Ah! Not funny, not funny. <laughs> And welcome to The One Show with Alex Jones. And Chris Evans. Tonight, a frightfully... <laughs> beautiful Hollywood actress who starred in Zero Dark Thirty and The Help. And now she's in what's likely to be one of the biggest films this Christmas. Definitely one to watch if you're into stellar casts. Oh, into stellar casts, into stellar, into stellar. That's the name of the movie. Yeah. Very good. Yeah, yeah. Please welcome Jessica Chastain. Yeah. Hello, Jessica. Hi, guys. Nice to see you. Happy Halloween. Uh, happy Halloween to you too. But it's it's a big deal in America. It's becoming a bigger deal here. Yeah, it is. Slowly. I think, yeah, we're sort of oh, Halloween's it. a huge deal in America. How do they do it in California? Oh, it's an all-day thing. Actually, people dress up even before Halloween. It's like a whole week deal. The week of Halloween, you'll see ghosts and zombies and vampires, witches all over the street. Now you're from Sacramento. Is that yeah, right? all have, over Northern California. Yeah. Have you heard of Rob Cockerham? No. Okay, well, he's a really big deal with Halloween parties. Yep. This is what he dressed as last year. He dressed as Disneyland. Isn't it amazing? Yeah, it is amazing. Wait. I'm not sure how Halloween he is, though. <laughs> no, but it's impressive. It's, it's very impressive. Yeah, it's a bit awkward, but it's very impressive. How did he walk around like exactly. Well, good question. How does he get to the bar? <laughs> and this year, he's going as Downton Abbey. There you go. I mean, that wow. is not practical. It's Great not costume. Practical. Yeah. I mean, how do you have a drink? How do you get in a cab? How do exactly. you snog somebody? <laughs> exactly. Yeah. You just don't. Well, maybe he's trying to. He's hoping to pull a staff cottage or something like that. Who knows? <laughs> uh, you're you're aware of Downton Abbey, aren't you? Yeah, I worked with Dan Stevens uh, on Broadway. Cool. The dreamy Dan Stevens. Super oh, cool. he's lovely, isn't yeah, he? Yeah, he's absolutely yeah, so nice. gorgeous. All right, tonight we want pictures of the Halloween outfits you're wearing, and we want you to scare us. Yes. So in about three minutes' time, we will look suitably frightened, a bit like this. <sighs> And we want you to gather around the telly and be the ones frightening us. OK, got that good. OK, you've got a couple of minutes to dress yourself up, uh, get your camera fans out or whatever, and get ready. You're doing the frightening, we're being frightened. Yes, but first, a wildlife photographer had a fright recently when he came across this Goliath spider in Suriname that was the size of a puppy. It's that is a pretty big spider, it has Ooh. to be said. And now, especially for Halloween, off the back of that, the TV debut, the world premiere of the one show's Spider Dar. Release the beast! <laughs> to be scary, not cute. It's right, this, adorable. This is, <laughs> this is the one show, Spider Dog, OK? Just in case you hadn't guessed, it's only a cute dog in a costume. <laughs> they asked me to read that, just in case you thought it was a real spider dog. <laughs> anyway, would he scare the unexpecting people in Britain's streets? Well, he certainly gave it a good go. He gave it a go. Here we are at Queen Elizabeth Olympic Park. Me and this adorable little creature, Wallace the One Show Dog. Today, I need him to embrace the spirit of Halloween. Wallace, are you up for it? So first things first, Wallace, you need to look the part. Here we are. Here we go, let's go. Oh, you look quite frightening. Good boy. <laughs> Is it real? That, you know, that, it looks like it's got more than four legs. No, we thought Not it was really funny. Not really scary, no. <laughs> it, it was, was just, fun. It was funny watching the little dog looking at it, wondering what was going on. <laughs> You're just too sort of friendly. I need you to get into character. Think spider dog. easy as you think, frightening people. It's getting darker. Fingers crossed we can get some Halloween fear going. I didn't expect it to come around the corner. Yes. <laughs> 
<laughs> Are those a cute little dog? <laughs> Did you get any wetter than you already are? Yeah. No. 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 Oh, I'm so pleased. That was such a great well, reaction. We'll stand, we'll stand up there and watch the next one. Yeah. Yeah. Wallace, you're a natural as spider dog. Let's leave all of this behind for another year. Come on. Good boy. Good boy. Nice work, spider dog. Yeah. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, thanks, Lucy. Oh. There are other spider dogs, but Wallace is the one show spider dog. <laughs> and Kamal, you're in charge, but you're not Wallace's owner. Tell us about that. No, um, Wallace is actually owned by uh, people that I train, so they're Rob and Jess, and they've done an amazing job with him. So Wallace actually came to my pet training classes in East London, and I also have a um, company that supplies animals for film work. And when they contacted me, when the one show contacted me about supplying a dog, Wallace was the obvious choice. And okay, he... and Wallace did enjoy this. You must. He loved it. People, yeah. We don't want people to I think worry. I think he wants to keep the suit. OK, well, you can oh, keep the it's suit. It's a great suit. Hang on, hang on. No, no, it's far too expensive. No, you can't keep the suit. Sorry oh, about that. Well, no. Thank you, Wallace, yeah. and thank you, Kamal. Jessica, though, you're a dog lover as well, aren't oh, you? Oh, I love animals so much. I have a dog named Chaplin. His Tell us dog... about Chaplin. We've got a picture. There you go. Yes, there he is. Um, he, I got him from um, the pound. He was hit by a car before I got him, and uh, he has three legs. But he's the happiest dog in the world, plays fetch better than any dog I've ever seen. Really? Yeah, he's really Aww. special. The hound nice. pound. The hound pound. <laughs> That's what you call it? No, no, I, no, they call it the pound, but they should no, call it the hound pound. The hound pound. All right, good. Right then, you at home, we hope you've got your Halloween costumes on because it's time for us to look scared and for you to take your photo. So we'll start with Jessica. You need to hold it to camera four. Ready? Okay. Three, two, one, go. Hold it, hold it, hold it. Hold it, Hollywood actress. A lister. Hold it, hold it, and. Cut there! Thank you very much indeed. That was great. Okay. Okay, let's have a party. Do you have a party? Do we have a party now? A party? Yeah, because it's a wrap now, isn't it? We're done. All right, yeah. All right, that's now. Oh, no, it's okay. 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 So, three, two, one. <laughs> <laughs> the longer we do this for, the less we have to do. That's what I got! And now we send us. Okay. Got them? Brilliant. <laughs> um, right, send them to us now using the usual email. There it is for you. Or you can send them to our Facebook page. Now, it being Halloween, we thought what better place to send Giles than to a graveyard, a real graveyard. Yeah, not just any graveyard, but one located on Plaguey Hill. It's closed to the public as it contains thousands of the nameless dead. <laughs> For nearly 450 years, the Friars Bush Burial Ground has entombed secrets as well as bodies. To this day, the taboo about what lies buried here means that few in Belfast actually want to visit the place. I've been given special permission to come inside. This area first appeared on a map in 1570. Then it was a monastery. The clue is in the name. Friars Town. But by the 18th century, the monks were in hiding. The English penal laws had banned Catholics from practice. Highly secret, highly illegal Catholic masses were held here. One poor, unfortunate friar is said to have been hanged from the trees for his involvement. But the reason this place is a dead secret is more recent, and it lies beneath this green yet grim mound. This is a mass grave, the unmarked resting place of some 3,000 poor souls. The locals know it as Plaguey Hill. Originally, it was known as the cholera pit um, or the famine pit. And uh, the Plaguey Hill bit um, brings back a lot of memories to me because when children were young, the mother would quite often said to them, misbehave again and you'll go to Plaguey Hill. Quite a frightening thing to say, actually, isn't it? In the 1830s, Asiatic cholera gripped Europe and made its deadly way to Belfast. People started reading the cholera news to track the progress of the disease. With linen and shipbuilding industries, the envy of the world, the population was growing faster than the city could cope. Overcrowding and poor sanitation were the perfect breeding ground for cholera. Among the many records of life at the time held here at Belfast's Linen Hall Library is this startling account by one of the city's eminent medical men, Dr. Andrew Malcolm. 
it's clear why the disease hits so hard. Defective sewerage, too great crowding together, awful of all kinds allowed to be thrown into the streets. Within days, 3,000 were struck down with the disease and more than 400 souls were lost. It was a very quick disease. You could wake up in the morning feeling fine. By lunchtime, you'd maybe be feeling a bit unwell. And by bedtime, you could be dead. Bodies had to be buried within 24 hours. Sometimes they would have been covered in tar or quicklime, and uh, often the bodies were burnt. The bodies were burnt just here, and then buried on Plaguey Hill. For these people, there was no funeral, no headstone for them. No one saw fit to record their names or details. These were indeed the nameless dead. Outside of war, only one thing can rival a plague for a death toll, famine. And just 15 years after killer cholera, killer hunger saw the Friars Bush death pit reopened. Tens of thousands of people were pouring into Belfast from rural Ireland, really, seeking a bowl of soup, a bed in the workhouse, a ship for America. Many of these people were not only starving, but they were suffering from the road disease, a blend of cholera, typhus, dysentery. And so they spread disease as they came, and they died like flies. By the end of 1847, more than 3,000 of Belfast's anonymous dead had been stacked high in Friars Bush. Now, for the first time, geologists from the city's Queen's University are able to use ground-penetrating radar to examine the mass grave. They've discovered there are actually five distinct pits here. Many are still fearful of opening up Plaguey Hill, but with this new technology, you don't have to break the ground. But in the 1930s, the Belfast Corporation wanted to widen the road and they were warned off by the public health authorities who expressed the fear that if a spade was led to the Plaguey Hill, it might reactivate the cholera bacillus of the 1840s. Though the science tells us that a 19th century plague can't plague us today, there's still a real sense that the dead secrets of Friars Bush somehow contaminate the peace of this graveyard. Thank you very much, Giles. Seems right. to be spooky. Very spooky. Mm. Uh, so British film director Christopher Nolan's new blockbuster, Interstellar, starring Jessica Chastain. <laughs> <laughs> Is that a week today? We're looking enough to have already seen it. Yes, we? we are. Uh, it's packed with thought-provoking statements such as this. We're not meant to save the world. We're meant to leave it. Oh. What if that's true? What if it starts with the BBC? We're not meant to save the BBC. <laughs> We're meant to leave the BBC. <laughs> Go away. Best off. Okay, other, <laughs> but there are some great profound statements. There are. There. I like, um, is it, love is the only thing that transcends everything. It, well, time, time and space. Time that's and space. It. Apart from knowing the landlord, which also helps. <laughs> Sorry, it's a pub thing. <laughs> uh, right, so, so as far as this script's concerned, the poetry must have been mm. so much easier than dealing with all the, all the scientific lines you had to learn. Yeah, that was probably my biggest challenge. I play an astrophysicist in the film, and she's dealing with the agricultural crisis on Earth in the future. And man, thank goodness we had Kip Thorne on set. He's a leading theoretical physicist because black holes, time, gravity, wormholes, I had to learn the whole thing. Well, this is the thing. You actually learn quite a lot yeah. watching it. I mean, I had a bit of a clue about a black hole, not a wormhole so much. <laughs> yeah. But now I have a grasp on a wormhole, Do too. you? See, I, I, I never understood the black hole. Then I got the black hole for this. Then you threw in the wormhole. I know. So who is this Kip guy that everybody talks about? Kip Thorne. He's um, our executive producer. This film deals with a lot of the, his life's work, the science on black holes. And if you see the film and you want to go deeper into the science of Interstellar, he's releasing a book that explains it all. Oh, very nice. Mm -hmm. But to go back to the plot, because the director, Christopher Nolan, is being very hush-hush about the whole thing. You're not allowed to talk about it. It's quite difficult. Anne Hathaway zipped Same it. Thing. Zipped yeah. it. What but can we talk about? What can we tell the audience? We can tell the audience they should expect a typical Christopher Nolan film, which means action, adventure, visually stunning, oh. things you've never seen before. It's a thrilling space adventure, 
But at the core, it's a film about the powerful bonds of love and about the relationship between a father and his daughter. That was okay. well done, well, because you just got us out of so much trouble we could have got in there. So thank you for that. You're welcome. And there is some surprise in it. Uh, it's very loud. It's a very loud film. Oh, but even the whole cinema was actually <laughs> yeah. shaken. Yeah. This is a film that's not meant to be watched. It's meant to be experienced. It's yeah. a throwback to the way movies were made when you go see it on the biggest screen possible. Okay. Did you ever work in tele sales? You're good at this, aren't you? <laughs> Thanks. Okay. We do have a clip, but it will make no sense to you at home. But anyway, basically. Basically, it's you in your brother's house. Don't say too much. Yeah. Just have a watch. OK. <coughs> the dust. Lois, I have a friend who <coughs> could look at his lungs. <coughs> There's the dust. There's the spaceships that aren't really spaceships, they're a bit more like buildings. There's all the other stuff we can't talk mm. about. There's the surprise appearances. And you play the daughter of the cleverest man in the world. So how <laughs> clever does that make your character? My character's a genius. I love <laughs> I hope clever. I get I hope I get typecast as playing geniuses. It's pretty great, right? It it's, is. It's a lot She's of work. Super to clever learn. your character. Yeah. Um, but Matthew McConaughey is is brilliant in it, brilliant performance. And your grandmother apparently was really excited to meet him. Oh my gosh. My family has met all these actors I've worked with. I have never seen the reaction that they've had, like, Matthew McConaughey all the way. She was throwing herself at him, <laughs> and he was flirting back He doesn't look too unhappy about it, to be honest. No. There he goes. I mean, his arm is around her waist, and she's looking up with these love-struck eyes, and... OK. More than that, we can't tell you, OK? Because we don't want to give that away either. OK. <laughs> it's very important there. Go on, then. What? Tell us when it's in the cinema. Interstellar is in the cinemas a week today, but we've seen it, like I say. Yeah, OK, we have to go and see it separately, because it's so secretive. <laughs> <laughs> and Interstellar isn't the only epic beginning next Friday. Now, the one show rickshaw is back on Britain's road, raising money for children in need once again. And it's time to meet another of the five youngsters, the brilliant youngsters, riding from Salford to Walford. And if you wonder why the BBC moved to Salford, it's so we could just have this link to rhyme. <laughs> Uh, five years later. Yes, 450 <laughs> miles across the UK. So let's hear Carolina's brilliant story. I'm Carolina. I'm 18. I love cooking. I love to read. And I'm loving training for Team Rickshaw 2014. Cooking. It's just a way to be with the family. It should be enough. I think it's just something that runs in our veins. That's it. I'm really, really proud of her. She amazes me every single time. It's taken a lot of training and I've put a lot of, you know, dedicated work into it. Definitely been a bit of, you know, blood, sweat and tears. I just hope that people get behind us. I've got two sisters and one baby brother, and I also had an older brother who passed away. My son Pedro was um, a lively little boy. He was born perfect, and when he was about two, he had a brain tumour. And then he was in remission from the age of two until he was 13, when he had bone cancer in, um, in his head. It was like... Uh... Uh, an atomic bomb for, for me and for the girls. I just remember running to my room and crying, so confused. I didn't understand why it had to happen. I just never understood. I always remember thinking, why wasn't it me? Even to the last few days of his life, I thought that he was just going to come through it because I never thought that I would lose him. It was just something that I knew could happen, but I never thought would happen. And a couple of hours after that, um, Pedro passed away at home. I think Carolina felt the brunt of him passing. I felt really isolated at school. I really didn't want to make friends. I wasn't interested in my work anymore and not talking to my family. I didn't feel like anyone understood what I was going through. And that's when Noah's art came in. Noah's Ark is a small charity. We help um, the families of children who are, are life limited. We offer family events and events of brothers and sisters. 
The sibling group, St. Noah's Ark, gave me a sense of normality, a place to have fun with other kids and just act like a normal teenager. Without the funding from children in need, we wouldn't be able to run siblings groups. Many of our families, happily, their children are able to live into adult life, but we help create memories um, that they can think back on if their child does sadly die. And I have them to thank for the happiness that they've brought back into my life. I'm really excited, but a bit nervous about the ritual challenge. Over 450 miles is you know, a bit of a push to what I usually cycle. Um, it's, it's definitely going to be a massive physical challenge. She will have Pedro oh, on, yeah. on that finish line. Oh, yeah. You know, that will be her goal. Pedro will be with me the whole way because I think, you know, if he went through cancer, I have to soldier through to make him proud and show him that uh, I can do it. Ah, oh, Carolina, so amazing. It uh, started, of course, a week today, and this year's Rickshaw Challenge, you can donate five or ten pounds. Here's Jessica, thankfully, thank you for doing this, uh, with the T's and C's, the terms and conditions. To donate five pounds to BBC Children in Need, text the word TEAM to 70705. Or to donate ten pounds, text TEAM to 70710. Text will cost your donation plus the standard message rate. All of your donation will go to Children in Need. Perfect. And you must be 16 or over, and please ask for the bill pays permission. For more information and full terms and conditions, that's just a highlight there for you, uh, go to bbc.co.uk slash pudsy. Yep, the lines are open now, so get your phone, please, and start texting. Now, speaking of uh, raising money, mm -hmm. Robin Williams actually helped you to get started in the acting profession, didn't he? Yeah, I'm the first person in my family to go to college, and that is because of Robin Williams. So was it a foundation he started? Or? He is an alumni of Juilliard, and he was a very generous person. Every two years, someone got a scholarship, and it changed my life. It so made so how, how come you got it? How come you were discovered then? I don't know. <laughs> what did I mean, you have to do? How did I you... mean, it was just, um, I had my first two years, I guess they thought I was doing a good job and, and I was the benefactor of it. And did you meet him? Uh, no, sadly, Aww. no. I know, I uh, sent him many letters thanking him and we spoke through other people and um, it's a very sad thing to have someone change your life so profoundly and never be able to mm. thank him. But I hope to continue his legacy of generosity. OK, well, and also, you know, you were definitely worth a scholarship, so in a way that, that's the yeah. deal, isn't it, there? So, yeah. brilliant. Well, now for something completely different, because this is the one show, breakfast. Oh, yes. <laughs> Often quoted as the most important meal of the day, can also end up as the most repetitive and, and adventurous. Apropos nothing to do with Halloween, Dan Donnelly <laughs> decided to mix breakfast up a bit. We love our Chinese, Indian and Middle Eastern dishes for dinner, maybe even lunch. But there's one time when we'd never think of trying a foreign alternative. Breakfast. So could we be missing out? Meet the Wickham family from Cardiff. Like a lot of us, breakfast time is a manic rush and habits never change. Before they leave home on a weekday morning, Dad John makes himself a cup of coffee. 11-year-old Sophie flips some pancakes. 14-year-old James loads up on cereal. Mum Susie tops her toast with butter. And they're all out the door. This week, though, the Wickhams have agreed to have breakfast inspired by some of our favourite international cuisines. Day one, and Palestinians Esam and Dalal whet the Wickhams' appetites with a Middle Eastern breakfast. It's a big one. The breakfast in the Arab world is, should be, I mean, the table should be really full of different kinds of food. It's not only one kind. And we used to share. Everybody shares the, the plates. So it's still very much a family occasion breakfast? Oh, definitely. Dalal gets on with whisking up traditional omelets made with spring onion, parsley and mixed peppers, which complement the falafel, hummus and fava beans. The omelettes are really good. Oh, I really like the falafels. I think they're lovely. It's fair to say some of the stronger chilli flavours aren't going down well with everyone. Only oh, yeah, a little bit. 
Would you ever have any of this again? The bread. I would more eat this for lunch. It would be such a long-winded thing to do before going to work in the morning. Day two and it's time for an Indian breakfast. I've roped in help from Pammy, who's making a savoury dish called Dahlia. What are the big differences between an Indian breakfast and British breakfasts? You don't have meat with it. In the morning, if you have meat, it's difficult to digest. That's true, actually, because I always feel like going back to bed after a full English. Pammy starts with some cooked bulgur wheat, then adds onion, peas, chilies, plus familiar curry ingredients like ginger and mustard seeds. Quite a departure from the closest British equivalent, porridge. This is totally different in a way because it's a savoury. Yeah. So we are not using milk, we are not using sugar. After just 15 minutes prep, it's tasting time. Well, I think this is delicious, I've got to say. This is good. You should make this more, Mum. It's a bit too spicy for breakfast. OK. But I would eat it for lunch or tea. That's three thumbs up. Is it a full house? Maybe not. <laughs> We've been heading east on our one-show breakfast journey. Yesterday, India, today, China. Rory Fong is originally from Hong Kong. He's making noodles with egg and sausage. What's breakfast time like in China? It's actually quite a rush. You kind of just grab something from a, a street stall or a cafe. It's not the biggest meal of the day in China, anyway. Instant noodles, isn't that cheating? No, <laughs> well, not many people actually make their noodles, and even restaurants serve, serve instant noodles. It's just a thing you do. It's like you don't make your own cereal, do you? Rory's serving his noodles with traditional Chinese tea eggs, dim sum, and fried eggs topped with sugar. I could get used to it. <clears throat> I think the yeah. flavours are lovely. I like the egg with the sugar on it. I've not had that before. I wouldn't put this as a breakfast. I'd put it as a lunch. So the Wickhams might not be swapping their cereal for a foreign alternative anytime soon. But of the three, which dish comes out on top? Indian. Indian. Middle East. Chinese. Split decision, but it looks like Indian's the winner. There you go, that was something completely different. Now, uh, back to Jessica, uh, star of Interstellar. It's out a week today. Uh, it's Halloween, of course. Uh, now, you'd like to be a superhero, wouldn't you, in a future movie? Yeah, or a super villain. Super but villain. It, if I do, if I do one of those movies, I gotta wear a cool costume and have a fight scene. Oh, definitely. Right? I can't be the civilian that just like hangs out and is boring. No. So a lot of those movies are made in Britain now, you know, because we're, we're enjoying mm. a sort of purple patch here. So, so look to that camera there. All the, a lot of the producers watching the casting people. Directors. Oh, go on, just tell them what you want. Go on, have, <laughs> have the BBC. Go on, have. You're really putting me on the spot oh, right now. Yeah. Um, cast me as a supervillain. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> oh, vote for me. Exactly. Uh, right. Okay, we ask you to send <laughs> yes, us your scary did. photographs. Scaring us on the telly. Bethany called the brilliant uh, from Cornwall, <laughs> age ten. Oh, that's good. That's a good one. Yeah. Uh, this. This is eight-year-old Millie. Aww. Oh, thanks, Millie. I love the makeup on her. Isn't she great? Yeah. Jessica, what do you? All right, here's Joe. He's scaring you guys. Very oh. scary. Looks like he's going to eat us. <laughs> okay, scaring Jessica, Reuben, and Kira. Uh, give Jessica oh, a wow. friend. Oh. Um, this is Zoe and Imogen uh, from Bridgend, being scary. Oh. Thank you for that. Let's have one. And one last one then. Uh, this is Louise. Thank you, Louise, for that. <laughs> Jessica, good luck with the movie. Um, how long are you here for before you go back to the States? Well, I have the day off tomorrow, so I'm going to do a little Very Christmas nice. shopping, and then I leave on Sunday. Are All there right. Halloween drinks tonight? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Brilliant. Get a hangover tomorrow. I might take my mask wherever it went. You're welcome. And go out on the town. Okay. Take some Halloween bumping. hangovers. <laughs> uh, be careful of them. By the way, Halloween means holy evening. Hallow means holy. Ian is Scottish for evening. There you Thank go. you very we'll much. We'll leave you with that fact. That's it for today. We'll be back on Monday with David Mitchell and Gareth Malone. We'll see you then. Happy Halloween. Tonight, Bye. everyone. Bye. -bye. <laughs>